Hello and welcome to the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center's Teach Teachers Workshop Series on Genocide. My name is Sam Parrish. This is Session 8, China Part 2. The previous workshop, Session 8, China Part 1, covered from 1900 to about 19, 1949. So we're gonna pick up from there, 1950 to present. And by present, I mean within the last few days, today being January 26th of the year 2021. So this is, this is going to go from 1950 to today and be very relevant. I, re I, I recognize that I have bitten off way more than I can chew by even breaking China into two parts. It seems like for whatever reason that this time frame, 1950 to 2021, so 71 years, it seems like somehow China has packed more history into that amount of time than say other countries. Now, obviously 71 years is 71 years, but it just seems like in terms of turbulence, um, events, changes that that China, um, China was able to pack a lot of history into that, that time frame of 71 years. Um, some certainly positive changes for China and along the way, a lot of death. We will look at, as always, the concept of genocide along with the other three mass human rights violations, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. Towards the end or at the end, I'll bring up a tracker that we've been using all along and we'll see, um, we'll break down if we think that any of the four previous uh, human rights violations have been, um, have been unfortunately met in China between 1950 and to today. And we will, do, we, will, we will approach China part two in possibly a different way um, from some of the previous sessions in that, again, this is so much information that a timeline approach would take weeks or months as opposed to an hour or two. So instead, I'm going to base this workshop entirely on the activities. So we'll provide five activities and they will span about that time frame of 1950 to literally to today. And um, that will cover the major events that will cover um, our area of interest, genocide and the other three uh, mass human rights violations as well. So this is a huge undertaking. And so this is the approach I'm taking for it. It's to look at the activities. And after all, that this is a teacher's workshop. So this, this needs to be specifically relevant for teachers. So let's do it with, uh, with a handful of, of activities that will be hopefully interesting and relevant. As I've done in the previous seven workshops, I want to point out and thank the Commissioner's Task Force on Holocaust Education for their ongoing support. Um, in the nine years I've been affiliated with this museum, the task force has been incredibly supportive of us here trying to help teach teachers how to cascade this information, um, this difficult information of the Holocaust and genocides to students. In addition to the Commissioner's Task Force, the Merrill Color Educator Series has been integral for the work we do specifically focused on teaching teachers. So combined, this is a force that's really helped propel us to do the best we can to help teachers teach. All right, so as we begin, I'm going to uh, remove myself from blocking off information that's on the screen. Hopefully you can see the full URL. Of course, all of this will be available on the, um, the activity sheets themselves, which are located in the session eight, China part two folder. We are gonna begin with two videos and they are based around the Great Leap Forward. And incidentally, I do want us to look at these, um, these propaganda posters as well. So let's, let's look at these propaganda posters 
and then we'll take a look at the first video, which runs about 12 minutes, which I think is, is short enough for students and their attention span. And we will just examine the second video in part because it runs 49 minutes. We're certainly not gonna watch it all and you'll see, you'll see another reason in addition to the length of it, um, why, we won't, um, why we won't watch that. But I'm gonna shoot us over to this website called ChinesePosters.net. And you'll notice that this is the poster I chose, but there are some others as well. So here's that poster that we're looking at. The commune is like a gigantic dragon. Production is visibly awe-inspiring. And so you see the dragon and you see an ancient China and you see the dragon bringing modern China to it. These are the people. And this is their bounty of food, of engineering, of military, uh, transportation, might in general. Similarly, brave the wind and the waves. Everything has remarkable abilities. Beautiful, beautiful photo, or rather uh, beautiful painting. You notice that he's stepping over an abyss, but he's on a, a, a gears. And following this worker, clearly a worker, is the military and more farm workers and people who are of the earth. It's interesting to see as they charge forward, all of them, <clears throat> all of them very positive, smiling. You see what appears to be a Chairman Mao sitting on a 19, late 1950s, not early 1960s style rocket ship. Um, this is an odd, to me, this is an odd aspect of it. Um, it's, it's reminiscent of the movie, Dr. Strangelove to me. Um, however, the general, the general idea is there. They're moving forward. Once again, we see the dragon and it's the idea of go all out and aim high. The east leaps forward, the west is worried. Here, the bright color, the dragon, the drums, they're moving ahead. Down here, something that is decaying. Here, another um, a very strong image, a very militaristic. You see a military man, and yet he also has, I think it's called an ADZE, A-D-Z-E, but anyway, it's a farm implement of some sort. Put organizations on a military footing. Put actions on a war footing. Put life on a collective footing. And everyone is marching ahead in unison. Electrif electrification, um, really trying to get this modernization. Interestingly, the next one up, a different style, I think a different style of, uh, of artwork. And we see Mao, very casual Mao, at one of the, um, the steel blast furnaces. Now everything looks hunky-dory here. Um, everything looks very successful. We know that they're an absolute disaster, these small backyard furnaces. Nevertheless, we see Mao and what is supposed to be success as he visits a homemade blast furnace. Again, 1958. Here we see a strong specimen of a, of a Chinese citizen, um, shovel, um, you know, draped, draped in this coat, and we see that everybody is fully occupied in production of some sort, right? The trade sector is fully occupied for everybody. They're all working together. They're strong. Here we see a Chinese drum circle, strike the battle drum of the great leap forward ever louder. This is a year later, 1959, but they're approaching the great leap forward as a war. Um, here, I. Confess, I'm not sure what this means. It's a fascinating though. Um, crossing the Yellow River while sitting in a peanut. It just, it escapes me, but it is very interesting. Transform the high river, temper yourself. Long live the general line. And you see this worker, a typical worker. This is again, similar to the Nazi idea of, of men and their hands um, in the dirt creating life um, at its simplest, you know, manufacturing, making stuff. In the background, we see what this is. Modernization, electrification, atomic energy, 
um, building of structures, skyscrapers, nuclear power plants, uh, a shipping industry, and all kind of supported by agriculture. More on the general line. Long live the general line. Long live the great leap forward. Long live the people's communes. This is 1964. By 1964, it was evident that this great leap forward was the proverbial epic disaster. And we'll see just how much so shortly. Production takes leap after leap. The nation is becoming ever more prosperous. Things are blooming. Here's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, painting, a young Chinese girl. And look at this harvest. Look at the, the bounty, the cornucopia that she's selecting from. The vegetables are green. The cucumbers plum, and I think that means plump, but maybe it does mean plum. The yield is abundant. Well, we know this is totally propaganda because of the famine that's gonna kill multi-millions of people. But nevertheless, an, a beautiful, beautiful imagery um, for propaganda, for sure. A different, a different take on it, but the same kind of idea. The melons are sweet, grain and rice are fragrant. Everybody tries the flavor. Everyone is eating. There is a bounty to be had through collectivization when the reality was, was completely the opposite. Here we see a man with, of course, the steel that they're so desperate, they were so desperate to, uh, to produce and at the same time farming. And of course, here you have the workers of all sorts. <clears throat> and they say, start the movement to increase production and practice thrift with foodstuffs and steel at the center with great force. The idea of thrift comes through today as well in that the, uh, the Chinese, uh, China has had problems uh, the last, for sure the last year or two with, uh, with locust infestations, with um, massive rainfalls and huge enormous floods. And unfortunately they were in areas of uh, rice production, I think corn and soybean production as well. And there's a general, it seems like there's a general shortage of food to the point where China is importing um, the basics, like I just talked about soy, corn, wheat, even rice um, from different countries around the world. And they're promoting this idea of thrift. Don't be boastful filming yourself eating massive meals and be thrifty, don't waste food. To the point where there are, I think areas where they are at least floating the idea of checking people's garbage receptacles to make sure that they weren't wasting food. And in a, an authoritarian, totalitarian type of regime like China currently is, that could be a um, uh, punishable offense. Here we are in 1960, another uh, drum circle, beat the battle drum. In 1960, we will continue the Great Leap Forward propaganda. Here we have hands that are lifting up an yet another bounty, steel and food at the center, develop industrial and agricultural production, realize the simultaneous development of industry and agriculture, people's communes are good. And so this is of a series, people's communes are good. You will see that phrase repeated again and again. And this idea of people's communes are good and it being repeated verbally on these posters harkens to the Holocaust, to the newspaper Der Sturmer, done by Julius Stryker, which had as its tagline on every edition, um, Die Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune. Yes, that was a negative attack said on a daily basis. This is posed as a positive, the people's communes are good. But the similarity obviously is a message, simple, palatable and repeated time after time. The people's communes are good. How could they not be? You have, you have uh, tractors, you have trucks, you have harvesters, um, you have automobiles, you have people celebrating. They're speeding up the mechanization of agriculture and what? People's communes are good. Here we have another agricultural bounty, including, uh, including animal agriculture smiles, beautiful colors, and we hear that communes are big. The people are numerous. The natural resources are abundant. 
it is easy to develop a diversified economy. People's communes are good. And certainly this was a, a team effort to develop a diversified economy with of course food at its center. You have to feed the populace. Here we have modernization, the telephone, a very strong figure central to all these other folks. The communes are big, the backbone is strong. It is easy to set up a unified system of allocation of avail available labor power, foster numerous troops of activists that are both red and expert to build up socialism. People's communes are good. This idea of activism, um, to foster activism in, in, in troops even, um, to build up socialism is an idea that's been bandied about more recently as well. Here is a great poster with definitely that 1960s artistic vibe to it as you look at this rocket taking off and the communication radio waves coming out. The idea greatly developed the sectors of culture, communication, and transport. People's communes are good. So here you have transportation, transportation, a train slash looks like electrified train, so monorail and trucks as well. Modernization. Here we have a dam, uh, Three Gorges Dam is, has been in the news recently um, due to the floods I mentioned. They had been experiencing possible, possible weakening of the dam. And um, that's debatable depending on who, who you listen to, who you read. Um, but if that were ever to break, the, the, the human loss would be monumental. And so this actually talks about the power to fight disasters is strong, to quicker raise the levels of production in life. And of course, people's communes are good. So here you have the people working right behind them is this modernization, hydroelectricization, if that's a word. And then lots more posters are fascinating. A sedan produced by your own country, drowning the enemy in a torrent of steel, the future of the rural, it's a machine. Of course, the people's communes are good. More about the blast furnaces and so on. They're uh, fascinating posters all about the idea of moving forward of electrification, of modernization, of autom automization. The idea that the people's communes are good as they do the great leap forward. So now for the first activity, this is where we want to introduce a film. It's 12 minutes long, palatable, I think, for students. We will use this, this video, which we'll watch in full, alternatively or optionally a video done by the CIA, uh, which runs 49 minutes. We'll just take a peek at that one there. Then we'll look at how to use those two videos in activity number one. So let's play this video, The Great Leap forward. By the way, uh, there is a, an image that may be considered graphic. I don't, I don't see necessarily that it is, but there is a brief image of a woman breastfeeding, and then there is a short snippet of an ad that runs about halfway through. So this is uh, to be warned if necessary. All right, so the great leap forward. <laughs> In January 1958, Mao boldly announced China's second five-year plan, the Great Leap Forward. An ambitious plan intended to transform China from an agrarian society into a modern, industrialized communist nation. How did Mao intend to achieve this monumental leap? Through collectivization and industrialization. Mao promised the Chinese people a communist utopia, and they believed him. He had defeated the nationalists, the imperialists, the Japanese in World War II, and liberated China. But the Great Leap Forward resulted in a humanitarian and economic disaster. Between 30 and 50 million people died in the Great Chinese Famine. How did the collective dream turn into a state-sanctioned nightmare? What went so wrong? 
In the years leading up to the Great Leap Forward, Mao had grown impatient with the slow pace of change. He wanted to speed up the transition by industrializing and collectivizing at the same time. Moderates within the Chinese Communist Party, including Zhou Enlai and Liao Shaoqi, disagreed. They wanted a gradual transition to avoid widespread social upheaval. Industrialize first, provide farm machinery to the peasantry, and then embark on collectivization. But Mao was determined. Factory workers needed to be well-fed to increase output. Peasants and farmers needed modern tools to increase yields. And because he effectively controlled the Communist Party at the time, Mao's radical vision won out. In 1949, farmland had gradually been redistributed from wealthy landlords to the poorer peasantry. Collectivization took this one step further. All private property was abolished, and every aspect of people's lives came under state control. Food distribution, housing, and work routines. The idea was that by working together, output would be dramatically increased. 4,100 people live on this commune, 970 families, 1,600 workers, a comparatively small commune in communist China in the year of the leave forward. Each commune would not only be self-sufficient, but produce sufficient surplus grain to feed urban workers, as well as sell internationally to strengthen China's economy. Everyone would contribute. These women were threshing millet. Children are excused from school and brought here in a group during the harvest season. Education and labor go together in communist China. Everyone, young and old, works during the fall harvest. Rural families were registered to their commune and unable to relocate without official permission. Food allocated by the state went to their commune, so if they left, they had no food. When famine hit in 1959, the situation for tens of millions of peasant farmers became desperate. The collectivization of workers occurred in the cities around factories and heavy industry. Equality for women was a key principle of the communist revolution. These women winding copper wire belonged to a neighborhood co-op of 380 families. In communist China, they are considered to be emancipated from housework to support socialist construction. The commune had its own nursery. Mothers took turns looking after children. Women get 45 minutes a day away from work to nurse their babies. Food allocated by the state was eaten together in communal dining halls. Officially, everything was going to plan on these idyllic communes. En route to the Sukhwan, on this people's commune, there are over 60,000 who cultivate about 30,000 acres of cotton, rice, and wheat. They claim production almost doubled in this two-crop region after the organization of the commune. Commune farms challenge each other and everyone is organized for production. But the reality was frighteningly different. Commune leaders set incredibly high production quotas, falsified production figures to please party superiors who, in response to these numbers, took an increasingly larger percentage of the yields that were in decline. Certain practices were based on poor policies, like the forced removal of fruit and vegetable crops to grow grain, even where the soil wasn't suitable. Mao's propaganda line was that these foods were bourgeois and not worthy of production. But what really drove the government's insistence on growing grain was that it was a more practical commodity to trade internationally. Within two years, communes across China suffered from severe food shortages. Commune leaders worked the starving peasants mercilessly. They were often treated like slaves, abused, humiliated, and beaten. 
Even though Communist Party officials, engineers and experts could see the madness of Mao's vision and the tragedy unfolding, few dared speak out. After the violent anti-rightist campaign in response to the Hundred Flowers free speech movement, they knew the cost of questioning Mao. Another part of the plan involved rapidly increasing agriculture output through crop experimentation. Recent communist agricultural policy on the communes calls for a close planting, deep plowing, plentiful use of fertilizer and irrigation. They have bamboo poles to keep the rice from trampling. Lights have been installed to keep it growing 24 hours a day. This is the rice they claim is yielding 11,000 bushels an acre. In the West, most of these techniques had proven to be ineffective, if not detrimental to yield. The peasants, having tilled the soil for generations, privately dismissed the practices as useless and ridiculous. However, they also knew that anyone who publicly criticized them would be denounced as a counter-revolutionary or capitalist and rehabilitated through publicly humiliating struggle sessions. Most communes never received modern farm machinery, not that it really mattered. The farms here did not look as though they were ready for a mechanization. It was difficult to believe that the small plots would lend themselves to the use of machinery. Here, hand labor would probably always remain at a premium. Agricultural production was carried out using China's greatest resource, human labor. This was also true of large-scale infrastructure projects. Every day in China, a hundred million people do battle with nature on the water conservancy front. Here they build a new reservoir near Nanking. Mao believed anything could be achieved through mass mobilization. The rapid industrialization of China was epitomized by the astounding steel production targets set by Mao. He wanted to double the steel production from 5.35 million tons in 1957 to 10.7 in 1958, the first year of the Great Leap Forward. Steel making went on inside the plant while construction continued outside. Their goal was three and a half million tons of steel a year by 1961. To catch up with Britain, heavy machinery at the plant was furnished by the Soviet Union. To this production is added the output of many small furnaces like this one. This plant made 30,000 tons of steel a year. And everywhere in China, near industrial plants and on communes, Small furnaces have added their output to the big mills. Mao instructed the people to smelt all their scrap iron, from cooking pots and woks to farm tools. Steel fever swept the country. The steel production drive, combined with national infrastructure projects, saw millions of peasants removed from farms and relocated to new places of work. Those who stayed on farms were encouraged to make steel rather than work their farms, which meant many crops were left to rot in the fields with no one to look after them. As backyard furnaces sprang up across China, the landscape was transformed. Towns and villages glowed like entrances to a fiery hell as smoke billowed out. The furnaces, which required a constant supply of wood, resulted in forests being stripped bare. The widespread environmental degradation was catastrophic, and all for nothing. The steel produced was of such poor quality, it was useless, and later, secretly dumped. Despite this, Mao wanted the policy to continue. The people banding together for a common cause made great propaganda. But in a sign of his now weakening position within the government, the policy was abandoned. Less than two years into the Great Leap Forward, it was clear an economic and humanitarian disaster was unfolding. 
An estimated 30 to 50 million people died of starvation in the Great Chinese Famine. Hundreds of thousands were also executed or beaten to death on the communes after being denounced as rightists or counter-revolutionaries. It could be for the petty crime of stealing food for their starving family or simply questioning local officials. Urban populations fared much better than rural populations, but starvation did hit cities too. While the economy initially grew, by 1961 it had crashed and did not reach 1958 levels again until 1964. The Communist Party admitted the policies of the Great Leap Forward had contributed to the famine. In 1962, Liao Xiaoqi stated, the economic disaster was 30% fault of nature, 70% human error. Mao, who had hoped that by initiating the Great Leap Forward, he would also regain authoritative control of the party, ended up on the outer. He stood down as chairman of the PRC, but didn't relinquish his position as chairman of the CCP. Mao retreated into the shadows, leaving Liao Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping to determine policy and run the country. But the chairman would make his comeback with devastating violence and fury when he launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966. All right, so that was the the twelve minute video. I want to take a look at this next video, and we'll just we'll just glance at it a little bit, because much the majority or all of the footage that we saw in the twelve minute version come from this film. This film is done by the CIA, although I don't know if the narration is by the CIA. Certainly, the footage is. So we'll take a quick look at that, just so we know. Um, you know, as an option, you've got that 49 minute version to show, obviously way more detail. And then we'll see how that relates to the activity, activity one. at first appeared to be the same city I had known 20 years before when I first came to China as a young reporter. A city of tree-lined avenues, of a culture recorded in millennia, whose monuments dated in centuries. But I soon learned Peking was full of new sights and sounds. The parade was just a rehearsal for National Day. There were many more apartment buildings than I had seen in the Soviet Union. The new planetarium was open. It has become a popular place for visitors to its observatory. A solar cooker. It was a featured exhibit. Outside the fairgrounds, there was a pool. Irrigation pump, one donkey power model. These women were threshing millet. Children are excused from school and brought here in a group during the harvest season. Red flags are Sputniks. You're a Sputnik or you're an ox card. And nobody wants to be an ox card these days. As in Peking, young students lined up for volunteer labor teams. The plant also has its own department store, canteen and club. Built during the Japanese occupation, the plant has been restored and enlarged following wartime destruction. They were also building a little furnace for the leap forward. The furnace was on the plant premises. The workers were still building it. All right, so that was just to give us a small idea of the footage, which is great, and the narration. The, uh, the narration, interesting to note that, that it, the tone, 
to it. So here, here's activity one, and, and this will make sense about um, what I mean by the tone. So activity, activity one is the Great Leap Forward. Watch the following video, the Great Leap Forward. That's the one we just watched for 12 minutes. Watch the following video about the Great Leap Forward. This is the one that's 49 minutes that we saw was from the CIA. And I noted here that the, the footage from in video one is taken from the CIA footage. So here are questions that will help us look into the Great Leap Forward through these videos. Question one, what differences did you notice between videos one and two? So uh, obviously there shouldn't be a difference in the uh, cinematography or the, con uh, the content of the filming. It's the narration, which leads us to question uh, two, which was, was one anti-China slash anti-Great Leap Forward, was one pro-China, pro-Great Leap Forward? So obviously that question would have to, re would require that the students look at both videos. And I think an answer will become, become obvious after watching them. So how, do, how does one explain the difference in tone between the first and second video? Then a general question about collectivization. We talked about that with the posters. Now here's an idea. We've seen collectivization. Um, I think now we should be able to define it. How was collectivization presented in each video? Again, the, the cinematography, the filming um, was obviously the same. So it was the narration that may have been different. So how was it presented and was it, pre was it successful collectivization? And was it successful, meaning was the narration successful in changing how we viewed um, the, the success or failure of collectivization? Did any of the conditions or situations stand out as surprisingly negative? Uh, one I listed here was that mothers were given, uh, it's mentioned in both videos, mothers being given 25 minutes per day to feed their infants. So when I mentioned before about the breast, uh, breastfeeding part and the gra you know, a graphic warning about that, it's in conjunction with, this, with, with po a possible answer to this question. Uh, giving 25 minutes to mothers is, um, is a strange, I think it's a strange way for us Americans anyway to, to view our time, which we consider ours. Questions from part two. We're going to use the following link to access the United Nations definitions of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. And here we are at the, at the United Nations, the link and the definitions. So we, we did this in the first, uh, first session when we introduced the general topic of genocide and mass, uh, ma mass human rights violations. So here where the definitions are, where they're actually defined and then examples, we've talked before about there being elements of the crime being a mental element, what is the thought behind it, and then the physical element that goes for crimes against humanity as well, which is also defined. Again, with the elements, the physical and mental elements of it war crimes, which is defined, and then a long laundry list of, of things that become violations or, or qualify as uh, war crimes, and of course the elements. And then the last one is ethnic cleansing. I said this in the first, and I've, I've said it a couple times over the, uh, the different sessions, but Ethnic cleansing is not recognized by the United Nations, but there are two definitions that, um, that tell us what, what it is and that I keep saying this, that we kind of have a feel for what ethnic cleansing means. So the last thing to note is that genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and ethnic cleansing, they blend. There are parts of each um, that cross over. So it, could there be war crimes during a genocide? Absolutely. Could, could all four happen simultaneously? Well, yes, they absolutely could. 
So we're back over to the activity one. Now we've looked at those. And what we need to do is identify any instances during the Great Leap Forward that match with those definitions of genocide and the other ma uh, three mass human rights violations. The last part of activity one is to use a supplement, which I'll show to answer these questions. So the supplement, which is also provided of course, is something that we introduced in session one, which is definitions of different uh, philosophies of governance. So autocracy, capitalism, communism, democracy, fascism, nationalism. And we talked about nationalism in the session, I think about Yugoslavia, um, not during World War II, but in the 90s and 2000s, we, we, we looked at the definition of nationalism, patriotism, socialism, sovereignty, which we talked about in session one. What, what role does a nation's sovereignty have? And then the last we talked about was totalitarianism, which we defined incidentally, or which we identified as probably the real issue here totalitarianism versus versus how we look at things as a left and right, we kind of concluded that it's totalitarianism that is the issue, whether it is from the left or from the right. All right, so the questions in section three of activity one, list the philosophy or philosophies that utilize centralization of the economy and or society. And so if you go over and you look at these definitions, I think um, you could find socialism, but what about what about fascism? There's also control, centralized control as well. I wonder if, as we look at these, we'll see that they're a lot more similar than maybe we think of from the start. Anyway, question two, identify which philosophy or philosophies best match with China during the Great Leap Forward. And the third question, based on China during the Great Leap Forward, which we've seen in the videos, how would you assess central planning? Is it effective? Could it lead to mass human rights violations? And if yes, is that because of the nature of central planning or could it just simply be coincidence? And so that is the first activity that helps us out with this idea of the great leap forward. And so that brings us back to the PowerPoint and this, this slide where we started, where we saw the beautiful posters. These are the video links the activity great leap forward, so onward. All right, so we looked at that time period. We looked at the posters, which were also often 1958 posters, but also 1958, 59, 60, and maybe a little, a little past then. So I think it's interesting that we see a quote, reputed quote, reputed in, uh, reputedly heard in Polish coffee houses. And that sounds odd until you see the quote. This is alleged. Thank God for the Soviet Union. We are lucky to have a buffer state between us and the Chinese. So that is a, is, is a kind of a fun and funny quote, but it's also, um, I would say, ironic for the obvious reasons of the Poles and the Soviets and them being actually thankful to have the Soviets versus the Chinese. So the perception, if this quote is accurate, is that China was extremely contrary to the propaganda posters that we saw. At the same time, we have a quote by Mao Zedong from 1958. It's a little bit lengthy, but it's I think it's worth it. This will give us a, a, a taste of what the thinking was in 1958 under Mao. So this is what Mao said during a speech to the political cadre. This is 1958. Quote, what's so unusual about Emperor Shi Huang of the Qin Dynasty? He had buried alive 460 scholars only, but we have buried alive 46,000 scholars. In the course of our repression of counter-revolutionary elements, haven't we put to death a number of the counter-revolutionary scholars? 
I had an argument with the democratic personages. They say we are behaving worse than Emperor Shi Huang of the Qin Dynasty. That's definitely not correct. We are 100 times ahead of Emperor Shi of the Qin Dynasty in repression of counter-revolutionary scholars." End quote. So when we see this quote, and we see the other quote from 1958, the Polish coffee houses quote, and we hear from Mao himself, there's a conflict between that and the posters and the videos that we saw. So what is the real story here? Well, before we head on to the other activities, there are these four websites that I would like to visit. And they kind of point out this time frame when we started in 1950 and we come forward. All right, so here's our first, our first website we'll stop at. It's called macrotrends.net. And this is looking for China and life expectancy. And the, the time frame exactly that we're talking about, 1950 to 1921. And if we look, though it won't give us raw numbers and it won't differentiate between natural deaths, uh, deaths at, in war and deaths caused by as the professor who we've used a little bit, R.J. Rummel from the University of Hawaii would call democide, which we would call genocide or one or more of the other mass human rights violations. Rummel refers to this basically as death by government. So we see here in 1950, we see an average life expectancy in China of 43.4 five years. And as we move forward by year, you can see 1952, slight, slight increase, 1956, minute increase, 1958, tiny increase, 60, small increase, 62, it's still in that 43 to 44 range. This is during a time frame from 1950 to 1962. This is the time frame when the Great Leap Forward was, according to the propaganda posters, producing a, a bounty of food and creating, creating a new economy for China. The life expectancy does not, uh, does not match up, does not reflect that bounty. Interestingly, in 1964, we see we start to see a rise and it really, really truly rises throughout the seventies. And then you know, it takes us up to where we are currently a lifespan of 77 years. So a 30 year addition from 1950 is significant. And then from there, of course, it's projections by the United Nations. So that gives us an insight into this time frame, especially this 1950 to say 1963 or 1964. A second way of looking at this is the website from UN Data, data.un.org. It brings up a whole list of countries. I am going to select, not surprisingly, when it gets here, I'm going to select China. And I did, I'm going to apply the filters. And this is a, another way to look at it. And of course, it, it contains real projections out to 20, 2100. But if we go down to that 1950 to 1955 timeframe that we saw on the previous website, you can see about the same, the same age range, the medium, the median age range of 43, and then the slow, almost imperceptible increase. So that's a 10 year period where it was basically 43 or 44. Now it's a 15 year period from 1950 to 1965 where the life expectancy, despite this great leap forward has not changed one bit statistically. Then something changes. And here we hit the 1965 to 1970. We saw it in the chart we started, we started to see an escalation here 
of life expectancy. So 55, 61, 65, and then continuing forward, albeit slowly until we take it to where we are today in that same range. So more support that this time period from 1950 to 1965 was horrendous for China, despite something called the Great Leap Forward. A third website and a neat way to visualize this is from a website called visualcapitalist.com. And this, this is very colorful and loaded with information and could be a neat poster for students to certainly to take a look at. So what are we looking at? We're looking at 70 years of economic development and policy in the People's Republic of China. I think to a student that might sound boring, but I think if we look at it, it it's a lot, it's a lot uh, more interesting. First of all, there's a lot of neat imagery on it, including Mao with the, the different spellings we talked about last session. We see his, we see his uh, reign. Then we see Deng Xiaoping, and then further all the way up to where we are currently today, Xi Jinping. So that gives us the leaders and their and their uh, their reigns. Then we see government issues, economic issues, social issues, and then major events that took place. The government launched programs, and that's not surprising as governments do, but the names, the names are definitely would be would seem exotic, kind of romantic to, I believe, to a Westerner. So for example, in 1977, we have we have something called the two whatevers. In 1975, although this is an economic issue, we see before modernizations. In 96, grasp the large, let go of the small. In 2005, the harmonious society. Uh, when Beijing held, <clears throat> Beijing held the Olympics. In 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative, that is an extremely significant uh, initiative with as global as you can get, global ramifications as you can get. That would be an amazing thing for students to look into is Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, followed the following year by Alibaba, the IPO for Alibaba. And we will see more about the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma, when we do activity number five, where is he now, essentially, is the activity. Um, again, we're up to Xi Jinping. So this gives us an idea with some nice imagery as well of what was going on and even a more of a timeline that we've done in the past for different sessions. But of course, the People's Republic of China being formed and then the first year plan and Great Leap Forward. And if you look, that 1953 to 62 coincides pretty much with, the, with the, the data that we just looked at for life expectancy. So it seems like the first five-year plan and the Great Leap Forward were, I think it would be fair to say, not successful, followed by the Cultural Revolution, and then a visit from Nixon, the death of Mao in 76, something we'll co cover in activity four, Tiananmen Square protests and how that was addressed by the Chinese and how the, how the world looked at China and its human rights record, um, something called the post Tiananmen retrenchment of course, how they, how they experienced the global financial crisis and the anniversary of the People's Republic of China. So some websites that, that pre present the information about life expectancy and kind of correlated up against government, economic, social, and other types of events. All right, so that was our little divergence from between activities one, activity one, 
and the following four activities where we saw those websites. So you have access to them. Should you be interested in looking them back up? A last website is this archive of New York Times and their coverage of China during this time frame. So this would be the uh, the master website to go to where I where you would find the articles that I'm going to use for some of the next for two or three of the next activities and a whole lot more and it's done in a uh, timeline timeline uh, presentation as well. All right, activity number two is simply called protest. We certainly had protest in the previous session as well. So this is uh, especially fitting in, in the times we're in currently in January of 2021, where we've seen a lot of protest in uh, throughout the world really. And a neat image here, and it coincides with an article about the Red Guards. So we're gonna take a look at the Red Guards all right, so here we have the Rampaging Red Guards and an article that is pretty tidy, I would say. Written in 1966. Now we'll take a look at the activity itself. That was activity one and it's series of definitions and here's activity number two protest so first and foremost we would read rampaging guards which we just saw then since we pointed out the period it was 1966 for this article we would do an internet image search using the term 1960s protests and 1960s riots as different search terms you could even add words like hippie if you wanted to bring in specifically american American protest or flash riot images, and some others as well, terms that you can think of to gather an array of images, and then search 1960s protests, Red Guard, in order to answer some questions, questions A, B, and C. Are there similarities across cultures and ethnicities? In other words, are young Americans in, pick a town or city in America somewhere, protesting slash rioting in a way that's similar to the way that, in this case, the Red Guard or others were uh, protesting or rioting in China during at, at the exact same time frame. Are there differences? And if so, what do you notice? What symbols, if any, do you see? And then follow that up with, are symbols used across cultures and ethnicities? Question three, based on the article, it refers to mass action. So why do you think they occur in different parts of the world, across cultures and across ethnicities? And do they spread like wildfire or do they just arise due to conditions? So let's go back and check out the article, the rampaging red guards. Um, and it does point out bands of teenagers. So there is the idea of teens, young people, like we saw last time, would that be would that be consistent across the board? Would we see similar age groups in America or France or somewhere else? Interesting how they refer to uh, a different appearance. It's interesting how this protest was to replace street names and anything else remotely imitative of the West. So they weren't imitating the West, they were trying to cleanse the West's influence. And so they considered that um, they would actually stop and give, uh, humiliate people who had haircuts or clothing that was Western in, in appearance. Um, they would desecrate Christian churches. Now this is the 1960s, desecration of Catholic churches has been going um, in the night in the 2020s and may still be today and so this idea very similar to what we saw in cambodia of this getting rid of all vestiges of the west 
So in that respect, this type of action is maybe different from what we would see taking place in, in the West. All right, so they're talking about mass actions. All right, so then to question four, why does it appear that teens and younger people are most involved in these events? In the article, Red Guards are described as using a quote, quote, a fierce attack on all old ideas, culture, customs, and habits, end quote. Do we see similarities today? Do we, see the, do we see them here in America, this idea of getting rid of these old ideas, old culture, old customs, old habits? If so, what are they? The tearing down of statues, the ridding of the founding fathers, um, a different look. Some would say rewriting American history. Others would say presenting American history more accurately. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that there are definitely, if not an attack, an approach to change ideas, cultures, customs, and habits. And is that supported by older people? The third paragraph is just one sentence and it says, quote, why the official encouragement, if not organization behind it? In other words, this article is saying that the government was actually secretly, quietly, surreptitiously either, uh, either promoting or supporting these, this move to de-Westernize. Interesting, do we, similar, do we see similarities to that today? If so, what are they? Some would say absolutely, we, we see similarities with especially with protests and riots by BLM, Black Lives Matter, not all of course, but some, and with Antifa, not all, but some, there is the idea that those two organizations have been supported by the government, just as there were, the, the, just as though, as there is the idea that, um, I, uh, organizations we would consider on the right, uh, Proud Boys, for example, were supported by and organized by the government as well. So interesting to look at anyway. And then answer the question, why would official or governmental organizations encourage or assist organizing violent protest? I mean, does it, does it support their aims? Do the ends justify the means? Question seven, in the fourth paragraph, the author points out that a quote, privileged class among senior officials, end quote, and former businessmen were able to continue to operate, quote, their state-owned enterprises. So we would now hearken back to the definitions in, that's in the supplement from activity one. We would locate all governmental philosophies that might allow for privileged groups who were above the law to exist. Do we see that today? Many people would say we do. We are now on to activity three as we progress through time from the Great Leap Forward through the Red Guard. And now we are on to a new section where we will look at man's interventions depicted here with a cartoon, presumably of a very full and hefty Mao with a, apparently an emphasis again on rocketry, nuclear warheads, presumably based on the mushroom cloud, um, lecturing his people who are, as we can tell by their rags, by their skin and bones, and by the word hunger, that they are starving. So we need to look and see what this is about, this pivotal event, and squeeze it into an activity, activity three. So here we are, activity three, man's interventions. We're going to read Red China Eases Life in Communes to Meet Unrest. So after all of those posters which talked, which promoted collectivization strongly, so strongly, and the great leap forward being in support of that idea, but also propelled by that idea of the commune, we're seeing here that they're admitting that 
um, that the communes, that collectivization, at least to this degree, wasn't working well. So we'll take a look at that article in a moment, but we're going to start off with, I think, defining the word commune. Once again, we're going to use the United Nations definitions, and I've included the link again. You've already seen that. And then ask this or answer this question, under which of these definitions would less interference with family ties being a concession best fit? So let's take a look at the article and see where less interference with family ties as a concession fits in with, if it does, with those definitions. All right, so here we have Red China eases life in communes to meet unrest. This is now actually back in 1959. The, the second article we'll use is from 1961. So right off the bat, it talks about the, the rigid discipline of life in the communes, but it was showing how things were, were starting to ease to a little bit of a degree. Um, increased freedom, less interference with family ties. That being considered a major concession by the Chinese communist authorities. So the idea of freedom and not having family life interfered with, does that fit under any of those definitions? Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes or ethnic cleansing? Does it fit in there? Next, put the concept of cause and effect in your own words. And how do you see evidence of cause and effect in paragraphs two through five? Would you describe the effect to be positive, negative, or neutral? So let's take a look at paragraphs two through five and cause and effect. Increased freedom of activity and less interference with family ties were concessions. In addition, they reported food allotments having been increased to a substantial degree based on the fact that the China authorities, Chinese authorities were receiving reports that peasants were underfed and overworked. So it almost, almost sounds like forced or slave labor. Among major concessions was a system of crop retention controlled by the commune leaders and the workers' representatives. And this is very, very much so like the, uh, the Khmer Rouge um, emphasized, utilized during the uh, Cambodian genocide. And the irony is that the leaders and representatives are the ones determining the food needs of the commune. We saw, we've seen at different times, the military uh, sequestering food and then using it for profit, but also using it as a weapon. So the concept of food as a weapon is, is something that's, uh, that's important to know. And it looks like the commune leaders said 60% was what should be held for the people who were actually doing the labor. So now we'll see, how do you see evidence of cause and effect in paragraph six and then 10 through 14? Again, is the effect positive, negative, or neutral? All right, so paragraph six, we have this easing. The relaxation of control was said to have had favorable results for the communes, but other problems developed in consequence. Cause, relaxation of control, effect is some other problem occurring here. So here you have the greater consideration shown for workers, creating food shortages for people in major urban centers cause and effect right there in paragraph six. And then we had 12 through 14 at the bottom. So we're still looking for cause and effect and we're looking to see if, if the effect is positive, negative or neutral. So here we have reports from major cities being uh, depicted as grim as rural conditions actually improved. Uh, that tells about uh, residents of Shanghai unable to get bread for two and a half months. 
some were able to get canned bread as a rarity, something I've never heard of. In Canton and Peiping, pork rations were reduced to two ounces every 10 days. Sugar was doled out. In other words, rationing. And of course, where there's rationing, there is always a black market. Rice lines were increasing in size. It's interesting because we see food lines actually forming in different American cities. Is they're done in modern style, they're done while people are in vehicles. Prices were unaffected, but the shortages made it impossible for people to buy sufficient food despite the amount of money they had. And then even another effect, malnutrition. Children with swollen stomachs, older persons with gaunt faces, cause and effect. Based on the article, this is question D. Based on the article, does the concept of a commune come from a governmental philosophy that uses central planning for its economy and or society? Assess the effectiveness of central planning based entirely on this article. Next, we're, gonna, we're going to look again at this easing, this reassessing of the Great Leap Forward. We're gonna look at this article and ask what effects did the Great Leap Forward have based on paragraphs two and three. So Red China's Leap, Slowed by a Limp, paragraphs two and three. So a reassessment of the Great Leap Forward, industrial output had grown impressively, the effect. However, agricultural production sagged effect. And as a result of food rations, barest subsistence level and exports uh, were adversely affected. So yeah, absolutely cause and effect right there. Question B. Why does the author use quotes around natural calamities in paragraph four and suggests unfavorable natural conditions are not a good explanation in paragraph seven? So let's take a look at paragraph four for natural calamities and the explanation in paragraph seven. And here we have the first part. Last month, the Chinese communists reported more than half of all their cultivated land in 1960 was subjected to the worst series of, quote, natural calamities, unquote, in 100 years. Why does the author put that in quotes? If you recall, in the 12 minute video we saw in activity one, there's a quick, a quick um, vignette where, there's a little uh, percentage put up there of 70%, I believe, and 30%. 30% of the issue of this mass starvation was a natural calamity. 70% was human interference or human, um, human behavior. So I think that's possibly why natural calamities is put in quotes. Here in paragraph seven, we have the next question, which was about unfavorable natural conditions. So Western specialists believe that the un, unfa unfavorable natural conditions were not sufficient. They attribute part of the difficulties to be extreme collectivization of farming under the commune system. So once again, we're, we're coming right up against those, those propaganda posters and the idea of um, the communes being good and the communes being effective and the communes being successful. And we're seeing, we're seeing that smack dab going against it, uh, against the data and the facts. So paragraph five describes drought, floods, typhoons, hailstorms, frost, insects, and plant diseases as reasons for a down tick in agricultural production. That's at that time. An interesting way to, to rope into today's world for students is to look for each of those terms for 2020, 2020 and 2021. 
So has China experienced drought in that time frame? I don't know. I don't believe so. Flood, extreme flood issues, typhoons and hailstorms. I think hailstorms actually. Um, insects, yes, I mentioned the locust infestation and plant diseases possibly. So are there similar occurrences of happening in 2021? And then I think a follow-up to that is then, what are they doing in response? If you look at China's purchasing right now, they are purchasing soy, as I mentioned, soy, wheat, uh, corn, and even rice from different countries. So for example, I believe they're purchasing rice from Vietnam, but also India. India being a historic enemy of theirs. Well, and that um, and that these floods may be certainly are a uh, a cause or at least a partial cause of that. So maybe we can attribute 100% of that to to flood, but I'm not sure. I think government planning still is involved to a degree, but. It's something for students to explore. Similar occurrences. Uh, the insect as well is interesting. The locust uh, swarm, I suppose it's called a swarm, uh, happening in 2020 had an impact as well. All right, paragraphs eight, this is question D. Paragraphs eight and nine address China's grain production numbers for the years 1958 and 59 as inflated. Remember, those are the two main years that we were looking at those propaganda posters. Compare grain production numbers uh, between the years 2018 and today, in which direction is grain production heading? And what is China doing to address this? I've kind of spilled the beans a little bit on it, pardon the pun. They are buying up soy, wheat, rice, corn, pork, and other products in massive quantities from America, from Brazil, from Vietnam, from India, and other countries. Interestingly, they're doing that while many countries around the world, including, including Ukraine, Russia, and I believe it's Argentina or Venezuela, have stopped exporting crops that they produce in large numbers. So China is importing in mass numbers. Countries around the world are, have halted exports or are putting massive tariffs on their own people, massive fines on their own people for exporting. And from what I've seen, the United States is exporting in just enormous numbers uh, to China with a lot of our, of our agriculture, our plant and animal agriculture. Question E, paragraphs 11 through 14 discuss steel production. Is one of the effects of the Great Leap Forward an increase in steel production and where does China rank today in that category? So paragraphs 11 through 14. So they needed to improve, the assessment was they needed to, to, to do better in agricultural production. Right, and so here you go, 11 through 14, su support, uh, provide the information needed uh, to, in order to answer the question. So they're talking about reinvestment, they're focusing on agriculture and farm output along with industrial output. And it seems like if you can't meet the basic food needs of a people, it's going to be difficult to impossible to produce something such as steel effectively to support the country. So where does China rank today in steel production versus during the Great Leap Forward? Now we will head on to activity four, which will bring us much closer to today. And there we are. We're gonna utilize these two web, um, these two articles from that New York Times series. Then we're gonna look at a short brief video on the famous Tiananmen Square crackdown and focus on activity four called government crackdown. All right, so here we are, government crackdown. We're going to read upheaval in China. Biggest Beijing crowds so far keep troops from city center. Interesting. So we'll take a look at this article in a moment. And what we're gonna see here is, or what we're going to attempt to answer, define martial law. Two, or B, 
the author calls the actions of the protesters as mostly peaceful confrontations. In the next statement, he states that, quote, a few clashes were reported, unquote, but that the confrontations seem to be mostly peaceful. What examples does the author provide for peaceful or passive examples of resistance or protest? Further in the story, he notes that protesters use methods to, quote, turn the troops back, end quote, and that truck drivers blocked convoys. Are the examples that he provides further examples of passive or peaceful resistance? And a follow-up to that, can protest be peaceful yet active? So let's take a look at that article and we'll, uh, we'll look around a little bit and see where it talks about mostly peaceful confrontations. All right, so right off the bat, they're talking about huge throngs, possibly more than 1 million Chinese taking the to the streets to defy martial law and blocking troops. Here we see the city brought to a standstill by 300,000 protesters, plus rallies were held in Shanghai and Canton and others. Conclusion that they were mostly peaceful confrontations. So we've heard the expression here recently uh, in 2020 mainly about protests being considered mostly peaceful using the term mostly peaceful protests. This is using mostly peaceful confrontation. And to me, the word confrontation sounds a lot more active, physically active than does protest. Nevertheless, that's the, the author's words. And this is 19, 1989. So of course we're getting to Tiananmen Square. So a few clashes were reported, but the confrontation seemed to be mostly peaceful. They're saying that again. So we get it, it's mostly peaceful although there is some confrontation. Um, and there was on the other side, television statements, uh, television stations broadcasting and, and imploring a government military crackdown. So that was, that was not, it was uncertain whether that would be used or not. And it looks as though, again, we're talking about carrying banners. That is, that is a free speech Certainly a free speech issue. Then we see, of course, rumors spreading. Where there's protests where there are mass numbers, there are inevitably to be rumors. And the crowd size, crowd size growing. Again, estimated at more than 1 million people. So here we have the truck drivers driving in front of military convoys and citizens laying down on the ground in front of army trucks. Well, we saw that image, the famous image of the man standing in front of the tanks, and we'll see it on video as well, briefly. Talks about scattered clashes with 150 police officers using cattle prods to beat 45 students who were blocking military trucks. Looks like this spread into provincial Chinese cities and even rural towns. 20 students flanked by thousands of city workers, 400 hunger strikers. And on it goes. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see if this picks up in, in intensity, if it changes from a most, mostly peaceful confrontation to a more active and violent one. All right, so question C, how did the military react in general? Did the government take non-military action? And D, do the military and government's non-military actions, do the military and government's non-military actions fit into the United Nations definitions, again, of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or ethnic cleansing? Could it fit in there at all? And you know, not much of a hint, but obviously it's not genocide, obviously not ethnic cleansing, it wasn't during war. So could it be crimes against humanity? Well, we'd have to look at the elements again, the mental and then the physical elements. It looks like the physical element was certainly there and was the mental side of it? Well, we'll see. We'll see as we explore Tiananmen Square a little bit further. 
Next article would be crackdown in Beijing. Troops attack and crush Beijing protest. So new article. Crackdown in Beijing. Troops attack and crush Beijing protest, June 4th, 1989. All right, so question A. Why is there such a discrepancy between the estimates of protesters killed? Why might the four hospitals decline to disclose how many, to quote, corpses they received? All right, so this is, this is it definitely intensified. If it were still mostly peaceful confrontations, it was only mostly peaceful from one side, and that would be the people, not the military. So let's go and find out about the discrepancy in numbers and the hospitals not, at least four, four hospitals mentioned, not, um, not sharing numbers. All right, so again, tens of thousands of Chinese troops retook the center of the capital, killing scores of students and workers, wounding hundreds more as they fired what they call submachine guns at crowds. And it repeats it. And we'll see what they refer to as firing in the air and sometimes firing directly at crowds of men and women who refuse to move. Reports of the numbers are sketchy. So here's the, the bit about the hospital. Three Beijing hospitals rec reported receiving 68 corpses of civilians. Four other hospitals said they received bodies of civilians but, dis but declined to disclose how many. Students said at least 500 people may have been killed in the crackdown. Here we have that a thousand police and troops had been injured and some killed. So we see a number, we start to see numbers come out. Um, several thousand students who remained on the square left peacefully, still waving their banners. So we've got huge numbers, huge discrepancies in numbers here to, to look into in order to address question number one, or question A. Question B, why was the military action described as crushing a quote, counter revolutionary rebellion in the capital? The article references blacklists. What were the repercussions of being placed on the blacklist? Lists, the idea of lists has, is not new. It's, they refer to enemies lists. They can be as innocuous as, I suppose, us having in, in the back of our minds people who we just don't like, and we consider them uh, persona non grata, people who do not exist, people who um, are, our quote, enemies. Obviously not really enemies, but people who we don't like particularly. We've also seen recently references to making lists of people in America Different politicians have referenced that kind of idea. Not sure if, the, if they were being um, flippant or uh, provocative or doing this for effect, but, uh, but they have referred to lists and lists are, lists are a potentially scary idea. So that's why we wanna look at what are blacklists and the repercussions of being placed on one. In China today, we know that they have what they call a social credit score. So it's based on, really based on all the data that your life represents, websites you go to, um, a police record if you've jaywalked, uh, websites you visit, comments you've made on social media, are they pro or against government and so forth. And they start to, to form, in China, they, they actually apply a score to people so the ones who are more, of course, more favorable towards the government and to being more peaceful and less confrontational and less against what they want to be considered the norm, the higher their social credit score. And that, in a way, guarantees a person uh, access to all of what is available in life, travel, food, work, etc. The idea being possibly that a, a low bad social credit score could end up leaving a person without having access to those types of things, some or all of those types of things. So the idea of a social credit score, 
not dissimilar to a blacklist. Interesting to look at. Question D, did the students remain mostly peaceful as noted in the previous article? And if not, what actions did they take? So let's see really quickly if the students were peaceful the entire time. Well, first off, they call for a general strike. Again, that's, I don't think that's violent at all. That's, that's not an idea that's new. It's everyone's going to stop and they were going to force the government to listen to their issues, listen to their grievances. Here we see that students and workers tried to resist the crackdown and destroyed at least 16 trucks and two armored personnel carriers. Stu scores of students and workers ran alongside the personnel carriers, hurling concrete blocks and wooden staves into the treads until they ground to a halt. That's interesting. Then they threw firebombs at one until it caught fire and set the other alight after covering it with blankets soaked in gasoline. The drivers escaped but were beaten by students. Clutching iron pipes and stones, groups periodically advanced towards the soldiers, some through bricks and firebombs. So I think that kind of gives us an idea as we look, as we look further down. I mean, you, you just see buses being stopped and set on fire. How many people were killed? 38, 100 wounded, 17 dead, 13 dead, 100 wounded. I mean, the numbers are all over the place. But we see that the students, at least some, didn't remain uh, mostly peaceful. And I suppose maybe there's always agitators within protest groups, or there's the possibility that there are agitators within a, um, your or one's organization. So now let's actually take a look at the protest. We've, we've seen it in articles. Let's see what this looks like in a, a very short, a short video. It is called the Tiananmen Square Massacre. It's very short, two minutes and 49 seconds. And this is AP Associated Press footage and narration.
All right, so there we have a look at more recent, and it's neat to see the video footage at the end after having read the articles. We see a lot of similarities to, again, what we've seen recently, the tearing down of a statue, peaceful protests in the form of students doing like a sit-in. We see the escalation. We see, interestingly, that the situation becomes more tense as night falls. We saw what they referenced, sh soldiers shooting into the air. We also saw soldiers shooting at directly at civilians. And of course, then we saw this image live. All right, so we've moved on now. We've come forward from 1952 today. We just, we've seen a few events along the way that have highlighted some, not all, but some of China's approach to the concept of human rights. Activity five, China today, and the question, has it changed? Well, here we see an image of Uyghurs in a concentration camp, Uyghurs, uh, Chinese, minorities. They are Muslim. Those are mostly Uyghurs. There are also other minorities that I can't pronounce, but one other minority group that's in the way of China, and especially the China Belt and Road Initiative, is Kazakhs, Kazakhstanis, Kazakhs. And so they may be mixed in along with the Uyghurs. I know that in a northern area of China, up to maybe in Mongolia, that that area, they're trying to, China is trying to, ex, uh, to eliminate the, the local language and have Mandarin become the, the language that's taught in the schools. And that's, well, the primary language. So when we look at things today, we'll see, we'll have to ask ourselves, has it changed? So China, activity five, China today, has it changed? China's certainly in the news today. Um, there's accusations, there's also uh, praise, accusations and praise about their economy, accusations and praise about the COVID-19 pandemic and everything in between. What is not debatable, China is projected to boast the number one economy based on gross domestic product in the not too distant future. I believe it's by 2027 that China is going to be number one. Currently, the United States is number one in terms of GDP. At that point, America or the United States will actually have fallen, project, will, have pro, will be projected to have fallen not to second, but to third, China, India, the United States. So a lot of, a lot of definitely economic progress that we saw the, the idea and the vision, I'm not saying it was good necessarily, but the idea and the vision that Mao had starting in 1950 and coming forward, we see it in a way coming to fruition uh, currently and in the not too distant future. The question is though, are they, what is their approach today to human rights? Has that changed at all since the 1950s? Incidentally, if you see that there'll be various spellings of the word Uyghur, those may be two, there may be more. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is look at the BBC article titled Huawei, Uyghur Surveillance Fears Lead PR Exec to Quit. Huawei was in the news. They're the ones who are supposedly forging ahead with the, uh, I, guess, I think taking a leadership role in the 5G idea. And that was something that the previous U.S. administration was adamant against was Huawei and them having a role here in the U.S. I think there are other countries as well who are leery, but uh, that's not for our, for our purposes here for sure. So let's look at the article. 
BBC, Huawei Uyghur surveillance fears lead PR exec, exec to quit. So how are we gonna fit this in to our activity? We're gonna read the article. We're going to identify who, what Huawei is and who, what Uyghurs are. What is their connection? Because we talked about the Uyghurs being a minority, a, a Muslim minority in China um, and Huawei being a technology company. So what is the connection? And the clue is the photograph that we saw of a concentration camp, work camp, and from their perspective, it is a, um, I think a, tra a vocational training center is what uh, I think what China uses kind of euphemistically like uh, the Nazis did for different, for different things, kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge um, to give something a nicer sounding name that is even remotely correct. Question C, a project reference in the article is about facial recognition and using it to identify people based on ethnicity. Based on the United Nations definitions of genocide and the other three mass human rights violations, how could facial recognition be used negatively? How could identifying someone by their ethnicity be used negatively? So let's take a look at the article. So it says that one of Huawei's European communications managers resigned. His concern was that facial recognition was being used to identify people based on ethnicity. Huawei's response, of course, we did not develop or sell systems that identify people by their ethnicity for discrimination or oppression. And here's another, sorry for the ad. Here's another line. It is believed that the Chinese government has detained up to a million, one million Uyghurs in this province in what the state, that would be China, defines as re-education camps. Well, we see, certainly see the term re-education camps used uh, a little bit today, actually, in reference once again in America, in contemporary America, January of 2021, we see people referencing deprogramming people who, who, think, who think politically differently from those currently in power. So deprogramming um, and others have even suggested camps. There's a range from um, John Brennan, ex-CIA leader, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Peter Schiff, so politicians, and also some media folks, um, Don Lennon from CNN and others have made reference to, again, whether it's over-the-top bombastic language, um, or if they mean it, running the gamut about lists, which we talked about blacklists, deprogramming, similar to this re-education idea, and then even camps, um, a, a, a national, um, an, an NPR accountant, I believe, highly placed person referenced actually, I believe, taking children from people who thought differently. So that idea is reminiscent of what the Chinese are possibly doing today. And actually, it's something that the Nazis used during World War II, where they took children and sent them back to Germany to be raised as proper, good Aryan Germans. So this idea of deprogramming and re-education camps taking place in China with echoes, hopefully not serious echoes of that in the United States, uh, regardless of your political philosophy, should be a little bit frightening to people. Let's get past those crazy ads. Zwicky is the one who, is, uh, who noted his departure. And the, and the article continues. And it's the concept of using, uh, using facial recognition uh, to base one's ethnicity and therefore discriminate against them. So would that fit within the human rights violations per the UN? Possibly. And again, the article states that 1 million Uyghurs were re in re-education camps based on the name for a student. Define re-education. What does that sound like? 
then using an internet search engine, find a definition from an online dictionary. Does, does a uh, definition exist? If not, do a general search term for a re-education camp and see where else it's being currently used and in what context. Well, we just talked about it being used in China today and being talked at least bandied about in some circles in American politics. Question two is to read the, Siena, the CNN article titled, She Tweeted from Sweden about the plight of her weaker cousin in Xinjiang, the authorities were watching. Note again, the different spelling of Uyghur. And here, the, the, the key is that a tweet was being watched by, by the Chinese government. So let's go take a look at that article. All right, and so here we have CNN's article just noted. Here is a weak, the Uyghur family that's referenced in the article. And let's see what the questions are that pertain. So this is a story about a Uyghur woman who had two stints in what are referred to as internment camps. So what are internment camps and are they the same as re-education camps? What crime did she uh, commit to land herself there? And aside from Uyghurs, as I mentioned, ethnic Kazakhs were sent to, quote, vocational training centers, and they were designed to fight, quote, extremism. So are vocational training centers, internment camps, and re-education camps the same? What is extremism? Can extremism be viewed differently depending on who is observing it? And then bring it, bring it around full circle. How could a center for vocational training help fight extremism? Young lady Elima tweeted that her cousin had finally been freed. The following day, she was taken to a hospital and claimed that that was how the Chinese government was going to censor her. So what is censorship? We hear that as an issue today, certainly in China and also in American social political circles. We see censorship possibly with some of the social media companies, some of the major social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I think I just ran out of the social media as I know. Censorship, interesting idea. Where, where is it hate speech? Where is something hate speech? Where is it free speech? Where's the line? So what is censorship? Something to think about, it is relevant to today. Are there guarantees that allow people to speak uncensored? In this case, what, what role would Twitter play? Has Twitter been involved in censorship? And if so, where and when? And again, you can bring that to uh, back to the United States and it'll depend on how you define censorship. Question E, provide examples from this article about crimes against humanity and or ethnic cleansing. So do we see that in the article? Last article, uh, as mentioned earlier about Alibaba, the company where um, products are sold in huge numbers at really low prices. That's the best I can come up with for a description of what Alibaba is. However, I will tell, tell you that Jack Ma is one of, if not the most wealthy human on earth. Um, the article, Alibaba founder Jack Ma has fallen off the radar. Here are some clues why. All right, so there is Jack Ma. And let's see what questions we can build around this. Well, first and foremost, who is Jack Ma? We've sort of answered that, but students could dig into that a little bit, find out who the creator of Alibaba is. What did Ma say that may have angered the Chinese government? So there's a clue right off the bat. By falling off the radar, we're talking about he's disappeared. And as of today, January 26, 2021, not that I've done a lot of searching in the last few days, but Jack Ma still has not resurfaced. So where is he? Could he be under house arrest? Who knows? So that's why the question B. Question C, is he the only Chinese person to have run afoul of their government? Provide names and a brief summary of what happened to them. Another 
person who comes to mind is Jackie Chan, the uh, martial artist turned actor, I believe. And um, how he, to some degree, ran afoul of the government, of their government. Question D, how does the concept of free speech come into play regarding Jack Ma? Is he free to say what he wants without repercussions? Is he free to say what he wants knowing there could be repercussions? So then really, what is free speech? Question E, is his disappearance as of now, to my knowledge, an example of genocide or the three mass human rights violations? And if not, how does it generally reflect the government's approach to their people and the idea of human rights in general. And here we come to the end with an article that juxtaposes or bookends um, Mao versus Xi Jinping. So this is actually really interesting and handy because it starts us off in 1950 and, and then bookends us in 2021. And it's a comparison between the two. So let's see what, what comparisons are drawn. This article is done by the Council on Foreign Relations and it's uh, titled Communist China's Painful Human Rights Story. And it is uh, dated 2019, so a couple years old, which is, so that doesn't even have so much of the, uh, the more recent issues that China has been through in terms of weather, in terms of economy, in terms of geopolitical issues, Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc. cetera. Uh, it also doesn't touch, I don't recall if it touches on the use of vocational training centers slash internment camp slash concentration camps. But what it does do is covers uh, Chinese history from Mao in 1949, 1950, all the way through Xi Jinping. Of course, rehashes a lot of what we've talked about in the 1950s, uh, refers to kangaroo courts, lawless violence struggles, the 100 Flowers campaign, the anti rightist campaign, the millions of officials, intellectuals, academics, and legal personnel who were sentenced to what the party calls or called re-education through labor. All right, so this, this concept of re-education through labor is in a frightening way, not dissimilar to Arbeit macht frei or um, freedom through work, which was of course a euphemism, a Holocaust euphemism for being worked to death here is being worked so hard that one's thinking would radically change. And what it talks about here is uh, years of harsh punishment. So encompasses the, the great leap forward, that 58 to 61 period, especially that they're focusing on costing at least 30 million lives. We'll look at the tracker and see what numbers we came up with. And then as we saw when we first opened the People's Republic of China and that life expectancy starting to go up, coinciding about 1966 with the Cultural Revolution. And it, interestingly how this refers to the national nightmare ending with Mao's death in 1976, bringing us way fast forward to Xi Jinping where this article does indeed refer to more than 1 million Muslims and their human rights being taken away as they're being deprived of freedom of movement, freedom of communication and detention. So in a, in a sense, they're being held incommunicado and isolated. So they're being disappeared although the, the guess is one of the numerous, numerous concentration camp slash re-education camp slash vocational retraining camp, whatever term they're using, let's just call it what it is, which is a concentration camp. And so this article is large in scope, 
and certainly not a not a favorable look at China in the last 71 or so years. This might be a good way to begin a study of China from 1950 forward to look at the, the 1950s side with Mao and to look at today with Xi Jinping. The last thing I wanna look at is our tracker. For those of you who are attending your first of these sessions, we have, we began with a general look into genocide, crim, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes and ethnic cleansing, which we refer to the latter three as mass human rights violations. We then in session two looked at Cambodia. We, we broke these into different sections depending on in many cases who was in charge and the time frame. We documented the type of the philosophy of governance. We applied today's left-right paradigm to it. If the country changed its name, depending on who was leading it. And then we asked the question, was it totalitarian? As we said earlier, we think that's the main issue really versus the left or right. Um, who was in charge and the numbers of people who were killed while that person was in charge. And again, these are all outside of war deaths. Uh, then we asked the question, or we determined, was it genocide? Was it crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing? And later we added the concept of religious intolerance and the, a general lack of human respect as red flags that indicate that these crimes again, uh, that these mass human rights violations were potential, although not really tangible, uh, although religious intolerance is somewhat tangible. Um, they do seem to indicate that there is a foundation for these types of, of human rights violations to occur. That especially came up in actually Mexico and the Mexican Revolution when we looked at that. And we saw a just a horrific approach to murdering people, a lack of respect of humanity um, and in religious intolerance as well. Then we looked at Yugoslavia, and this was during World War II. Then we looked at Yugoslavia after, it's, after it broke down in a session we called Once Yugoslavia, because it broke apart into numerous pieces. We then addressed the Ar Armenian genocide, and that brings us to today. So we looked at We looked at China from 1900 to 1945, uh, 49 rather in the last session. And then that brings us to today. China, 1949 to present. The, a name that kind of catches the essence of the period. So you have the establishment of the People's Republic of China. You have the five-year plans and the Great Leap Forward. Cultural revolution through Mao's death. A reform and a pullback. Um, that should say pullback from 84 to 87, not 94 to 87, and then Tiananmen Square all the way through today, corresponding years that match. And then we determined that throughout since it has been communism, the, the, it has been communism, which we associate with today, today's left on the left-right paradigm. The name has been the People's Republic of China. The leadership was Mao Zedong, then Deng Xiaoping, and then various leading up to Xi Jinping. We looked at numbers, numbers killed. And as always, we don't, we don't compare and contrast to see which one was worse, which one was better. But this is for our purposes to track. According to RJ Rummel, this is the second most massive in numbers government that committed what he calls democide. Rummel says over 35 million people. Other sources have said between 15 and 55 million. Hundred, hundreds of thousands to 20 million. We're looking at numbers that are just, just so huge in scope, it's hard to, it's hard to understand. But know that the majority of, of sources put communist China as the second most prolific murderer of its own people. Yet, was it genocide? Well, 
no through these different reigns, although I think you could actually say yes to today at, as it goes towards the Kazakhs, the Uyghurs, and also the, um, the ethnic group that I forget its name in uh, Northern China slash Mongolia. However, we can definitely say throughout that crimes against humanity have been committed, whether it was under Mao in 1950 or Xi Jinping in 2021. War crimes during the war, war period, most assuredly, I would think. Ethnic cleansing, well, again, yes, today, because we're looking at the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs and, and the Mongolians who are being addressed in different ways by the government based on their ethnicity. And then we saw the article about Huawei and using artificial um, AI and other means to identify people based on their ethnicity. China, of course, as a communist nation has been religiously intolerant throughout and actually recently has really, really struck against the Catholic faith, Catholic churches being destroyed, um, Catholic priests being harassed and arrested, parishioners not being allowed to attend or practice their faith. Lack of human respect, I, I don't think people would disagree uh, that yes, in general, though not quantifiable, there is definitely a lack of respect of human respect. So that's China, 1949 to present. Next up in session nine will be Japan. We will return to more of a timeline approach because it's a shorter period, 1937 to the end of World War II, 1945, where we'll, we'll be able to focus a lot more on the specifics as opposed to something as large as China. Well, with that in mind, as always, the materials will be in, in the folder where you found the video link. There will be the activities. There will be the list of URLs for you to, uh, to be able to follow along. There will also be a, a short, I believe it's four question survey. You can copy and paste it. It just asks when, what session you attended and then to give a, a tiny little bit of feedback. It really helps because again, coming full circle, the Commissioner's Task Force on Holocaust Education and the Merrill Collar Educator Series, both of whom have been integral in, in helping these sessions take place, would, it, would like to see at least some sort of tracking of proof that people have been attending. So if you're able to do that and shoot me a quick email, I'd appreciate it. I'll put my email address in there on the form. Nevertheless, my email is simple. It is sam at hmcec.org. That's sam at hmcec.org. I'd like to thank you so much for your attendance, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, thank you.